Our next speaker is Dr. Ari Cedas. He is board certified in adult congenital heart disease and cardiovascular disease. He is currently the medical director for the Center for Adult Congenital Heart Disease at Baylor Heart and Vascular Hospital in Dallas. Prior to joining Cardiology Associates, he served as an assistant professor of medicine and cardiology at Washington University School of Medicine, where he was a recipient of the Craig Reese Award for Excellence in Teaching and the Benico Bazili Teaching Award. Please help me welcome Dr. Ari Cedas. Thank you, everybody. Uh, and thanks for inviting me to speak with you here. I'm sorry, I had to take a photo because it's so incredible how much this conference has grown. We have to document the event. Um, so I'm hopefully going to catch us up a little bit because there's really basically almost nothing to talk about with regard to Schoen Complex. So it should take me a, a much shorter period of time. Um, and I have no relevant disclosures to this oh so common condition. Um, we'll talk first about the definition because I know when I was learning about Schoen complex, I could never remember exactly what the various components that made up Schoen complex were. So we should review those solely for academic purposes because you're not likely to ever see one. We'll talk about the epidemiology of Schoen complex anatomy and then go into um, repair briefly. So what is Schoen complex? Well, there are two flavors. There is the flavor that was originally described by the Canadian cardiologist, Dr. Schoen which is the complex of a supravalvular mitral ring, a parachute mitral valve, subvalvular aortic stenosis, and coarctation of the aorta. Now, this is where I tell you that this is all very interesting, but this is about as common as a jackalope. Anybody in the crowd know what a jackalope is? It exists really only in taxidermy. Um, no one actually has seen one in real life. And this, entity probably exists similarly in jars on anatomists' shelves, but the probability of you ever actually seeing a complete Schoen complex is around about zero. In the practice, people describe Schoen complex as, a, as incomplete, what we're calling incomplete Schoen complex, which is the coalescence of one LV inflow and one LV outflow lesion, and they don't have to be the inflow and outflow lesions described originally by Dr. Schoen, as alluded to by Dr. Singh. It could include uh, a core triatriatum. Um, it could include other congenital forms of mitral stenosis, and in terms of outflow lesions, it could be a bicuspid aortic valve, could be a hypoplastic arch. I think the easiest way to think about what we think of as Schoen complex is kind of an incomplete hypoplastic left heart syndrome where there's some kind of restriction to inflow and some kind of restriction to outflow. And in the majority of cases that we see in adulthood, they've gone through a two ventricle repair. But it, since we are talking about Schoen complex, um, I will show you what a jackalope looks like to a cardiologist. Um, so you will notice that there is the supravalvular mitral ring parachute mitral valve, and what is a parachute mitral valve? It has nothing to do with, you know, um, you know D-Day or, or, or Normandy, or um, it has to do with the fact that the valve, uh, chordae tendinae are all attached to a single papillary muscle instead of to two papillary muscles. And so obviously there's no separation between the leaflets and you, the blood has difficulty kind of meandering its way through the leaflets, and functionally it's a stenotic valve. Subvalvular aortic stenosis and then coarctation of the aorta um, depicted here in the um, uh, juxtaductal position. So, um, this is the only existing study, and I'm saved by the group in Montreal for actually producing a study just within the past couple months on Schoen's complex, because basically there is no data on Schoen complex in adult patients. And what they did is they looked retrospectively at their entire 4,300 more patient database of congenital patients and found 28 with something similar to Schoen complex, only one of whom actually had the full Schoen complex. This is why I say you're very unlikely to ever to see the full gamut of Schoen complex on the adult side. They included the incomplete Schoen complex, those are the other 27. And as you can appreciate, in the top, this is from the time when these patients were first seen in their adult congenital clinic to the time when they first ended up getting hospitalized. By 10 years, almost half of them have been hospitalized for something or another. The second slide shows 
how, at what age most of them got repairs, and, and you can see that by, by the time that they're, they're eight, 10 years old, almost all of them have had some form of repair, probably due to just the series of obstructions in tandem. And then the last slide shows you, um, uh, shows you what is it actually? Uh, survival re free from reintervention. Um, so most of the repairs that take place deteriorate over time. And the primary types of deterioration that occur in Schoen complex are needing reoperation on the aortic valve. There's something about the aortic valve or the way it was repaired in childhood that requires a reintervention. Reinterventions on the mitral valve, something about that repair that requires reintervention, or reinterventions on the subvalvular membrane, which has a tendency to recur. So I'm going to go through those things sub, uh, and why they, we might think they, they could recur. So starting with subvalvular aortic stenosis. This is a paper from Boston which demonstrates that subvalvular aortic stenosis is a, is a result not only of whatever genetic factors are responsible for the production of Schoen complex, but also the result of shear forces along the kind of angle between the interventricular septum and the aorta. And even after you've resected that membrane, and in theory, the whatever developmental mishap occurred to produce the membrane in the first place, those shear forces remain. The angle between that aorta and the interventricular septum is likely not to change substantially throughout life. And so you will have a continued pathological stimulus to the area where you've previously resected the membrane, and the membrane has a tendency to recur, if not resected in <laughs> extensively. In addition, patients who have had a subvalvular aortic stenosis that causes a high velocity jet, like holding your thumb over a hose to hit the underside of the aortic valve, denuding the endothelium of the valve structure, which makes it dysfunctional. And if you add that dysfunction to any surgery that you had to, uh, to do during childhood to address congenital valvular aortic stenosis, it makes it that much more likely for the aortic valve to have problems, predominantly for it to become regurgitant. Um, so these are two kind of survival series. And I will say, all of the survival series that I'm going to show you for both this and for mitral valve disease are from pediatric age on. There is no analysis out there only looking at natural history in adults who have had Schoen complex or parachute mitral valve or subvalvular aortic stenosis. So survival is good in the one on, let's see, it would be on your left. Uh, that, that is actually from Boston. The bottom shows survival. The top shows survival from reintervention. The one on the right is Dr. Udikem from, uh, from Australia. Top is survival and bottom is freedom from reintervention. And you can see that survival is actually quite good after a section of subavular aortic stenosis. However, the need for reintervention is not uncommon. And um, it's, it's always either repeat resection of our current subvalvular aortic stenosis, the criteria that we use according to 2008 guidelines, which take them for what they're worth, 10 guys sitting around a table with a beer, no offense to present company who are involved in the production of those uh, guidelines. Yeah, no. Nah. Uh, but uh, the, if you achieve a gradient of greater than 50 millimeters of mercury systolic or 30 mean um, uh, or if you have progressive aortic valve insufficiency, those are indications for repeat resection of the um, subvalvular stenosis. And it is more common to need a reintervention. This is also this is from that same paper that came from Boston. It's more likely that you're going to need a repeat intervention in somebody who had subvalvular aortic stenosis if, at the time of their original surgery, they had aortic stenosis. Meaning, when the surgeon went and mucked around with the aortic valve, it's more likely they're going to get a leaky valve later. And almost all of these patients that required an intervention had leaking of the valve as, this, as a reason for reintervention. Moving on then to parachute mitral valve. Again, precious little data on parachute mitral valve exclusively. The first study I'm going to show you, oh, taking a step back. This is actually a natural history study, if you can believe it, from Toronto looking at parachute mitral valve probability of survival and probability of needing uh, repeat valve surgery or an initial valve, I'm sorry, initial valve surgery um, in people born with a parachute mitral valve. You might notice this upfront kind of mortality rate. And these are people who had a hypoplastic ventricle as a result of congenital stenosis of the mitral valve so that they couldn't have a, a two ventricle repair performed. Um, but, and that's just 
a part of the fact that these studies all include pediatric patients. We, that, this, these patients we would never see in our clinic. Um, but if you ignore this kind of, oops, oh boy, that skipped fast. Okay, so if you ignore this early part, you can see that there is a continued, there's a continued drop off and a continued mortality and a continued need for valve surgery among patients who have parachute mitral valves. Among those who have had surgery, whether for parachute mitral valve or for a non-parachute mitral valve associated with Schoen complex, believe it or not, this is a series of pediatric patients with incomplete Schoen complex, some type of mitral valve disorder, parachute mitral valve, hammock mitral valve, submitral arcade, whatever it was. Um, I would ignore these um, right-sided graphs. I looked at them this morning. They basically make no sense, so just ignore them. And I mean, and I don't really know how you can do a Kaplan-Meier when you start with six patients. Uh, that's just kind of, <laughs> that's really stretching the data. So if you just pay attention instead to the left-sided graphs, you'll see that there is some early mortality. This levels off after the early childhood period. However, there continues to be a need for repeat intervention on the mitral valve after repair. Looking specifically at those who have had a two-ventricle repair of a parachute mitral valve alone, on the left is a group from Germany, on the right is CHOP, and you can see that there is um, a continued mortality rate even um, after surgery, a continued need for re-intervention after surgery. At CHOP, these are all mortality after intervention and two-ventricular repair for a parachute mitral valve. This is all the patients. They separated them into parachute mitral valve, and because that group wasn't small enough, they decided to separate the parachute mitral valve into the parachute-like asymmetrical mitral valve and the parachute mitral valve. I guess they did I, define a, a group with lower risk. The parachute mitral valve patients did worse. Um, and then obviously, if you have other medical conditions like a conotruncal abnormality associated with your parachute mitral valve, you're more likely to require, you're more likely to have problems long term. So um, I think that I should have almost uh, actually come close to catching us up, uh, although maybe not exactly. The take home message is there are not that many jackalopes, you're unlikely to see one. However, a shown like complex is a clinical entity. The criteria that we use for surgery on the mitral valve are largely the same as those used for the primary problem with the operated or unoperated mitral, uh, parachute mitral valve, which would be mitral stenosis or mitral regurgitation, mostly stenosis. I've talked to you through the criteria for uh, repeat operation on subvalvular aortic stenosis, and these are patients that require lifelong monitoring due to the propensity they have for requiring repeat procedures or for mortality long term. And with that, I will conclude.